hi I've just finished filming this but I feel like I need to film a little clip to insert at the beginning of this just to give you a little warning trigger warning style thing we're talking about heavy things in this video we're talking about child abuse murder kids yeah um if you feel like that's a bit much for you then I will not blame you if you want to skip ahead and maybe wait for next week's video um yeah it's a intense one but it's a very very interesting case so if you don't want to watch then continue watching hey guys and welcome back to my channel for another midweek mystery or actually no this isn't a mystery i have finally decided to do a solved case on my channel i've had so many of you asking me to do a solved case i've been very unsure about it i just i like the mysteries like personally i don't watch solved cases myself but i'll always click on a unsolved crime but seeing as so many of you ask i do have one case which has always fascinated me and that is the case of daniel morecambe i think the reason that this case intrigues me so much is the way that it was solved was so smart and like so well done on the police's behalf that i feel like kind of everyone needs to hear this story because it is crazy so daniel morecambe was just 13 years old when he went missing on the 7th of december 2003 from near the Sunshine Coast, Queensland, Australia. He lived in a place called Palmwoods. Now on the day that Daniel went missing, his parents, Denise and Bruce were out and it was just him and his two brothers, his twin brother Bradley and his other brother Dean all at home. And Daniel asked Bradley if he wants to go to Sunshine Plaza, a nearby sort of shopping mall. Daniel was gonna get his hair cut and buy some Christmas presents for his parents. Bradley says no, he wants to stay at home. So Daniel goes off by himself. He walks to the nearest bus stop and starts to wait for the bus to Sunshine Plaza. Now this was a trip Daniel had taken on his own so many times before. He knew where he was going. He was quite a smart, intelligent 13 year old. He was quite mature for his age. He loved animals and he wanted to be a vet when he was older. So he left the house just after lunchtime and walked towards the bus stop. It was actually an unofficial bus stop. It was at a place called Keels Mountain Overpass. And even though it was an unofficial bus stop, the bus would still stop there to pick people up. So Daniel walked there to wait for the 1.35 bus. It was only meant to be a 15, 20 minute bus journey to Sunshine Plaza, but Daniel never arrived. He was there at 1.35 waiting for the bus and the bus didn't turn up. Unknown to Daniel, the bus had actually broken down about 750 metres away and it was just on the side of the road. However, there was a replacement bus coming, but the replacement bus had been ordered just to pick up the passengers on the stranded bus and head straight to Sunshine Plaza and not stop on the way for anybody else. But there was also a extra small shuttle bus coming up behind to pick up any stragglers. So at quarter past two, Daniel's still waiting at the bus stop and the express bus that isn't meant to be stopping drives past and the driver sees Daniel waiting there and sort of gestures to him like there's another bus on the way. That was at 2.15. At 2.18, the extra small shuttle bus arrives at the bus stop but Daniel isn't there anymore. Now the first bus driver, the one that went past at 2.15, actually radioed to the bus driver behind specifically to say, there's a boy at the bus stop by Kills Mountain Overpass, stop for him. So in that three minutes, something happened to Daniel. Later on, the first bus driver and the passengers on the bus said that Daniel wasn't the only one at the bus stop. There was also a man standing behind him. This man was quite gaunt looking, unkempt. He had a tattoo on his shoulder and he was just sort of hovering there. It looked like he was waiting for the bus as well. So nobody really thought anything of it at the time. When the second bus arrived at 2.18, that man was also gone. So Bruce and Denise, Daniel's parents, arrived home that day about 4.30 p.m. and said to Bradley, oh, where are your brothers? Now Dean had gone to a friend's house, which was fine. And Bradley said that Daniel had gone to Sunshine Plaza, but he wasn't home yet. Bear in mind that Daniel had left to go to Sunshine Plaza about three and a half hours earlier. His parents immediately knew that something was up and it was weird that he wasn't home yet. So his parents call the bus company and the bus company tell them about the confusion with the broken down bus and the extra buses. So his parents kind of assume that Daniel is stranded somewhere on the side of the road and so head out in their car to sort of drive the bus route and see if they can pick him up. Only they don't pick him up because he's not there. At 7.30pm, Daniel still isn't home and so his parents drive to the police station to report him as missing. However, the police say there's not much they can do at that time, they need to go home, wait for him, call around and see if they can find anything, if he's not home by tomorrow morning, to head back to the station. So his parents did go home, they sat up all night waiting on the sofa, they called everyone they knew to see if anybody had seen or heard from Daniel and nobody had. So at 7.30am the next morning on December 8th, 
they head to the police station and file a missing persons report. By 9am, Daniel Morecambe is officially a missing person and his parents are already contacting the media, getting his name out there, doing anything they can to help the search for Daniel. And the police started a massive manhunt for Daniel. It was a large scale search, it had helicopters, they placed a mannequin where Daniel was the day before to try and get passers-by to call in with tips, maybe say if they'd seen him, what he was doing, things like that. Um, they had dogs, they had everything they could to try and find Daniel. And the mannequin placed at the bus stop did jog a lot of people's memories because the police started to get so many calls in. A lot of people said they just saw him waiting there. Obviously Daniel was there for about 45 minutes waiting for this bus, probably longer. And so a lot of people saw him there. Apparently he was just stood there drawing in the dirt with a stick as any 13 year old boy probably would do. A lot of people also reported seeing the same man that the bus driver and the passengers had seen, the gaunt, unkempt looking man with the tattoo on his shoulder and a goatee. And there were also many sightings of some cars in the area. A lot of people reported seeing a blue sedan near the bus stop. Some people said it was parked up, some people said it was driving. One woman even said that she was driving along and then all of a sudden this blue sedan came speeding past her with somebody in the back violently punching the chairs. However, a lot of people also reported seeing a white 4x4 in the area as well. This story just started off as local media news, people in the area trying to find Daniel. However, soon it became a massive nationwide hunt. It was on national news. Everyone knew Daniel Morecambe's name and everyone was looking for him. Now, the police spoke to so many people, but the man at the bus stop never came forward. And for the police, this obviously meant that the man had something to do with with it because if he was innocent he would have heard the story of Daniel Morecambe going missing it was everywhere and he probably would have come forward the fact that he didn't said to the police that this was the man they were looking for of course the first people police looked at in the area were the local sex offenders and there were 39 sex offenders living in the vicinity of the bus stop at the time that Daniel went missing the police obviously interviewed every single one of them but they all had alibis and none of them really seemed that suspicious to the police at the time. The search for Daniel Morecambe was one of the most extensively investigated crimes ever in Queensland history. It's up there as one of the most extensively investigated crimes in all of Australia. This was massive. As of December 2008, there were one million Australian dollars up for anyone who could give them information leading to the discovery of Daniel Morecambe. $250,000 of this was from the government and $750,000 of it were private donations. This money was never claimed by anyone and his parents, Denise and Daniel Morecambe, searched so much for their missing little boy. They said that it absolutely destroyed their family, it broke them in the years following Daniel's disappearance, they moved house, they spent every penny they had on trying to find their son. They personally followed up every single tip they got, they helped the police in every way imaginable. They were seen many times searching on their hands and knees in the dirt looking for any clues that could lead to Daniel. I can't even begin to imagine the amount of pain that comes along with losing a child but these parents are incredible. The things they've done since Daniel disappeared to help others has been amazing. On the 31st of May 2009, so this is now six years after Daniel disappeared and they've never found anything, no clues, no evidence, nothing. The police are at a dead end, it's a complete cold case. On the 31st of May 2009, the private donations, the $750,000 expired, but the private reward money remained, so there was still $250,000 up for grabs. On the same day that money expired, an Australian news network called Seven Network reported about a potential suspect in the case. He was a known paedophile in the area called Douglas Jackway and they said that he could be of interest in the Daniel Morecambe case. He had a history of snatching young boys off the streets, he drove a blue sedan, he had a goatee and tattoos and he lived about an hour and a half away from where Daniel had gone missing. This Douglas Jackway had been recently released from prison and they said that he had a high chance of reoffending. Why they let them out of prison when they have a high chance of reoffending is news to me, I don't know, but that's that was the case here. The police did take this seriously. They never gave up searching for Daniel and they did everything they could. But around that time in May 2009, police placed a full-sized model of their suspect, Douglas Jackway, 
at the bus stop where Daniel was last seen. Last time they did it with a full size model of Daniel, it was very successful in getting lots of tips in. This was six years later and it still worked. They still got 300 calls. However, this didn't lead to anything. It was another dead end. The police couldn't link this guy in any shape or form to Daniel's disappearance. Over the course of the investigation into Daniel's disappearance, the police did over 10,000 interviews. They personally interviewed 10,000 people. They looked through over 20,000 leads and they took every single lead seriously. But again, despite this, they never found anything. In 2010, Daniel's parents demanded that an inquest take place. And this inquest started in October 2010 and it ran through till April 2011. They basically took anyone and everyone up onto the stand to try and look into what happened to Daniel. Over 35 high-risk people in the area were interviewed on the stand. And as none of these people were able to be identified by the media at the time, they were referred to as P1, person one, P2, P3, P4. You get my gist. These were some of the most fucked up people in the area. These were the police's possibly main suspects, even though there were 35 of them, the police didn't really have anything to go on. But these were the ones that the police thought were most likely. These were not good people. And one of them actually confessed to putting Daniel's body into a barrel and dumping him into the Brisbane River with the help of an acquaintance. The police took this seriously. They went to the Brisbane River. They sent divers in, they searched extensively. Turns out this person was lying and was kind of just doing it to amuse himself, I suppose. Denise and Bruce attended every single day of the inquest. And can you imagine that pain of hearing, yes, I dumped your son into the river and then finding out this person's lying. It must get to a point where they just want to know what happened to their son, whether he's dead or alive, they just want to know what happened. Now there was one person during the inquest that Denise Morecambe said chills her to the bone. And this person was known throughout the inquest as P7. His real name was Brett Peter Cowan. Brett Peter Cowan was gaunt looking. He didn't look all that clean. He had a goatee and he had a tattoo on his shoulder. He matched everything that people described as the man at the bus stop that day. He had no social life or interest. He was always kind of the black sheep of the family. He was a loner. This man was disturbing. He was the worst kind of man imaginable and he had a long long history of sexually abusing children now when i was researching this case i read all of the depraved things he did and i am not willing to repeat these on my channel i do not want to talk about them they were horrible if you want to know some more details give it a google i'm sure you can find things out but it was disgusting bear in mind that i talk about a lot of really awful people in this series on my channel this man is the worst of them all. But in a nutshell, he started targeting victims when he was a child himself. He said he went for young boys aged between eight and 10 and therefore Daniel was too old for him at 13. That wasn't what he went for. He would target children at open swimming pools where he could easily escape when he needed to. He got first convicted for child abuse and paedophilia in 1987. And then he was let out and then again in 1993 in Darwin he abused a six-year-old boy. Again, I'm not gonna tell you the details here, it's not relevant, you do not need to know, but you do need to know that he abused him, abducted him from a caravan park, and then left him for dead. The boy, six years old, later wandered into a service station and the people who found him thought he'd been hit by a car, his injuries were so severe. And Brett Peter Cowan, who never told anyone in the caravan park where him and this boy were living, that he had a history of child abuse, he helped join the search for the boy's abuser. He was like one of the most vocal members of the community searching for this depraved, awful person. It was him. He only confessed when police started to zero in on the caravan park, taking DNA samples from everyone. He knew that the jig was up and so he confessed. He was sentenced to seven years for grievous bodily harm, but he only served three and a half of these. After the three and a half years were up, he moved to the Sunshine Coast. Now, this is a man who has been in prison twice for child abuse. How they can let him out of prison early the second time, I don't know. How could they do that? How could you justify letting someone like that out of prison? The chance of reoffending is so high and he did it again. This guy was a sociopath. He was a complete narcissist. He openly said that he thought his victims would never report him 
because they probably enjoyed the experiences. So Cowan moves to the Sunshine Coast and he actually moves in with his aunt and uncle who are devout Christians. And Cowan becomes a Christian himself. He starts attending church. He's a very vocal member of the Christian community in the area and he meets a woman and he marries her. Now it's not really known how much the people around him knew of what he'd done in the past. Um, it's thought that his aunt didn't really know much, his uncle knew bits and pieces and it's thought even his wife, the woman who married him, knew bits and pieces of his past and I'm pretty sure you don't need to know his whole past to know how horrific this guy is. But this woman marries him believing that he's now a devout Christian um, and they have children of their own which makes me sick to my stomach. Him and his wife though did divorce five years later and thank god his wife got custody of the children. However him and his wife were still together when Daniel Morecambe disappeared. I couldn't figure out if they were like together but just not divorced or if they're actually like still happily married I'm not sure but they were still living together at the time. Now Cowan was first interviewed after Daniel disappeared. He was interviewed on the 21st of December 2003. He owned a white 4x4 and matched the physical description of the guy at the bus stop but the police came to interview him and he had what was at the time a solid alibi. He said that he spent the morning working in the garden and then at 1.30 he left the house to go pick up some mulch from an acquaintance. He said that he returned home at 2.30 and he even said that the route that he took to get from his house to his friend's house to pick up the mulch led him past the bus stop and he even said that he remembered seeing the bus broken down but the police still couldn't find anything more. Obviously this made him a massive person of interest so the police asked for DNA samples and he voluntarily gave them DNA samples. He even let them do a whole forensic sweep of his car, the white 4x4 and they found nothing. The police started to look into his alibi and spoke to the acquaintance he'd gone to pick up the mulch from. And this person said that Cowan was actually only there for five minutes. That gives us 45 minutes about of unaccounted time in Cowan's afternoon that day. He was re-interviewed again a couple of years later in July 2005 and this is when he admitted seeing the broken down bus on the side of the road. The officers end this interview by asking him, if you had abducted Daniel, would you tell us? And Cowan replies, probably not. On September 14th, 2006, Cowan is interviewed by police yet again. And this time they ask him about his strange alibi and that unaccounted for time. This is when Cowan says that he has a drug supplier who he didn't mention earlier called Sandra Drummond. And he didn't mention her earlier because he didn't want her to be implicated in whatever was going on. And also him going to pick up drugs still probably doesn't look good on his behalf. Please go and interview this drug dealer, Sandra Drummond. And she says, she was like, I can't remember if he was bound that day or not. It was two, three years beforehand. And of course she couldn't remember if he was there that day. If you ask me what I was doing on a random Sunday three years ago, I couldn't tell you. So it was kind of understandable that she couldn't really give the police a straight answer. And this is where the inquest comes back into it. The inquest that ran from October 2010 to April 2011. Sandra Drummond was called up onto the stand. And this is where Cowan's alibi starts to completely unravel. Sandra said that her and her boyfriend went to the casino most Sundays and she said they'd done it for years. And she had a loyalty card and you basically put the card into the machines from what I can gather and it basically tracks whenever you're there. And Sandra said that she found out from the casino what time she was there on that day. And she was actually there from 1.30 till 2.30 on December 3rd, 2003. So Cowan was not around her house picking up drugs. However, at the inquest, Cowan said nothing to implicate himself. He answered every question the police asked and therefore they had to let him go and fly home. And this is where the police start to get very sneaky. On the flight home, Cowan meets a man who sat next to Joe Emery. The two get talking and they find out they have a lot in common. And Joe Emery was actually a career criminal. I think I forgot to mention before, but Brett was flying back to Perth, which is where he had moved after his divorce, after everything that had happened with Daniel. He moved to Perth to get away from Queensland. And it's on this flight back from Queensland to Perth that he met Joe Emery. Strangely enough, on Cowan's return to Perth, he is kind of freaked out about the entire Daniel Morecambe situation. He can feel the police closing in on him, especially after he's seeing his alibi unravel. He's heard about Sandra Drummond and her casino loyalty card on the news, and he freaks out. He changes his name. 
which to me just looks like a massive admission of guilt anyway, but he changed his name to Shadow Ananya Hunter. Shadow was apparently the name of a former dog of his, Ananya stood for none of your business, and I'm not sure where Hunter came from, but that's what he changed his name to, which is just very strange. So he's back in Perth, he's been fired from his job, he's desperate for money, and this is where he gets in contact again with Joe Emery, the criminal, and he becomes part of this criminal gang. Cowan's introduced to Paul Fitzgerald, or Fitzy, who is the boss of the crime gang, kind of. Um, he's given small jobs to earn trust and respect, and this whole crime gang is based on loyalty and honesty, and this is drummed into Cowan every time he goes on a job. You need to trust each other, you need to be loyal, you need to be honest, we need to help each other out here. He'd do all manners of crime for them, from picking up drugs to gun exchanges, stealing cars, bribing people, threatening people. He'd move big amounts of money about. He was getting paid big time. He started to lead a very lavish lifestyle. He was buying nice cars, nice clothes. He was just living the life based on the money that he was earning from being a criminal. But what Cowan never figured out at all is this wasn't a criminal gang ever. This was actually a massive undercover police operation known as Operation Vista. This was all part of a covert investigation procedure called Mr. Big. Now this is a controversial technique used by police in situations when they don't really have any other options. If you've watched the confession tapes on Netflix, which I would actually highly recommend, you might kind of have a gist of what this procedure is about and why it's so controversial. Um, but in this case, it worked big time. The basic idea behind Mr. Big, or is it sometimes known as the Canadian technique, is you convince the criminal that they are part of a big time gang and it's all based on trust and honesty and you need to keep yourself and everyone else around you safe. And so eventually you meet Mr. Big, the big boss, who you then confess your crimes to because he is saying, I'm going to help you, um, we can sort this out together and you confess your crimes. Now this technique was developed in Canada in the early 1990s and it's quite often used in Canada. It's actually illegal in the USA, which sort of gives you an idea as to how controversial it is. Um, for the Australian police to use it in the case of Brett Peter Cowan, they had to get a lot of permissions from a lot of people high up and it was all very closely monitored. It took a whole team of 35 undercover police officers to make this operation work. That is a lot of man hours, but the police were so, so sure that Brett Peter Cowan was the man they were looking for. But they had nothing on him. There was no clues, no evidence. It was all circumstantial. If the police didn't do something, this man was going to be free to roam and do this to other children and they had to get him behind bars, so they used this controversial technique. So on August 4th, 2011, Paul Fitzgerald, or Fitzy, picks up Cowan for a meeting with Craig. Now Craig was a corrupt police officer who was working with the crime gang and was sort of their like inside information. And Craig basically told Fitzy and Cowan that there was a subpoena out for Cowan's arrest. Apparently Cowan needed to appear in court again and Craig said to him, like, my information is 100%, I know this is true, the police are looking for you, and Cowan basically said, well, my new identity, Shadow and Anya Hunter, will mean they won't find me, but also my alibi is 100%, the police have got nothing on me, which of course wasn't true. At this point, Cowan already knew that his alibi wasn't 100%, he was beginning to waver. At this point, Fitzy keeps saying to Cowan, nothing can come back on us, do you understand? You've got to be honest, you cannot let anything come back on our group. The point of this was to get Cowan's guard down and to really get him to start panicking about what he had done. And he did start to worry, but he wasn't worried about being caught by the police for what he had done in the past. He was scared it was going to affect his new lavish lifestyle and his part in the gang and his new family of criminals, this gang that he had found himself part of. He was scared he was going to lose that. And then a massive job comes up, possibly the biggest one that Cowan's ever done. Bear in mind that none of these jobs that Cowan was ever doing was actually anything illegal, it was all like police planted. But apparently Cowan thought that there was a million dollar ecstasy imports coming into the country and he had to go and pick up. Him and Fitzy are on the way to this job when Fitzy gets a call and he gets a call from Arnold who is the big boss. 
Now, Cowan had heard whisperings about Arnold and how he was like the man in charge. And Arnold wants to talk to Cowan. So they turn right around and Cowan goes to the Swan River Room, the presidential suite at the Hyatt Hotel in Perth to meet with Arnold. And when they first meet, it's just like general small talk, chit chat, it's quite nice. And then the tone changes and Arnold starts to question him about the death of Daniel Morecambe. Now there is a massive, I think it's a 44 minute long audio recording of this entire conversation on YouTube, which I will link down below. It's a long one, um, it's not all that clear. It's definitely worth a listen to, just to hear how Arnold, who is obviously an undercover cop, manages to convince Cowan to confess to him. Arnold basically keeps saying, what we do is based on respect and honesty. I don't care what you've done. I've got no qualms at all what you've done, but you need to tell me so I can help you sort it out. I need to help you. If there's still a body there, I need to move. If there's any clues, it needs to be gone. Like we cannot let anything happen to you. We can't let anything happen to our gang. Like I'm here to help you fix this. And I think at one point he's also saying like, I know people in high places, we can get any subpoenas like dismissed. Like the police will not be after you anymore, you just need to be honest with me. And Cowan loved being part of this group, he wanted the companionship, he was living the high life, shall we say. He originally denies everything, and this is when Arnold threatens to drop him like a hot potato if anything comes back on the gang. And this is when Cowan cracks and confesses to what he's done. Now the undercover cop posing as Arnold really pries the confession out of him, which is where you can see that it can be a problematic technique because say it, Cowan hadn't done this um, and he just wanted to be part of the gang and Arnold wasn't really giving him a choice. He had to confess to basically remain a part of this but it worked out in this case because Cowan is the person responsible for the death of Daniel Morecambe. This is what Cowan confesses. He says that he's driving back from picking up the mulch from his friend and sees Daniel at the side of the road. Cowan parks his 4x4 in a nearby church and walks up to the bus stop and pretends to be waiting at the bus stop with Daniel. They see the first bus go past, which signals that there's another bus on the way, and Cowan realises it's now or never, he needs to, like, get the boy. So he says to Daniel, hey, I'm going to Sunshine Plaza, I'll drop you off, come with me, come in my car. And Daniel apparently willingly walks to Cowan's car with him and gets in the passenger seat. Cowan drives Daniel about half an hour away to an abandoned house that he knows of, and says to Daniel when they get there, do you want to come in? and have a drink of water. So Daniel comes in with him. Now I'm sure at this point Daniel was probably scared, not knowing what's going on, he's with this strange man, um, and they go into this abandoned house. This is where Cowan says that he didn't get a chance to molest Daniel, because Daniel starts to freak out and panic, and that makes Cowan panic. Bear in mind that Cowan said before that he only goes for eight to ten year old boys, disgust me to even say it, um, Daniel's a lot older, he's 13, he's got a mind of his own, he's very mature. So Daniel freaks out, Cowan freaks out, and Cowan wraps his arm around Daniel's throat and strangles him to death. Now we'll never know if Cowan's telling the truth about the fact that he never actually molested Daniel or not. We don't know, but I hope that he didn't. Being strangled to death by a stranger in an abandoned house miles away from your home is terrifying enough. I can just hope that Cowan's telling the truth about what happened here. Cowan says that he put Daniel in the back of his car and drove about 150 metres to a sort of secluded, bushy, woodland area. Takes Daniel out of the car and drags him down an embankment. He said the embankment's kind of sandy and then he puts Daniel's body in a sort of bit of shallow water and covers him over with some mud and some leaves and stuff. But this isn't before he's stripped Daniel, taken off all of his clothes. And he says that on the walk back to the car, he drops the clothes into a creek. Now he really hasn't tried very hard to cover up anybody here. I'm not sure how far out the police's search went, but considering the amount of volunteers they had looking for Daniel, I can only assume that the search didn't actually ever go out this far. Because if it had, I think they would have pretty easily found Daniel's body or his clothes. Cowan said that he went back later that week with a shovel to properly bury Daniel's body. And when he got there, his body was gone. It had already been exposed to the elements. He'd obviously left it in some shallow water. He decomposed quickly. And he said that all that was left of him was some sort of like bone fragments. So he said that with the shovel, he just split up the bones and buried it in the dirt. Bear in mind he's saying all this to Arnold, his crime boss, not any police officer. So I'm inclined to believe that he is kind of telling the truth here and not really like changing it that much. Um, but you'll never really know. 
But of course, this confession alone isn't enough to pin anything on Cowan. He, like I said, just could be saying it to keep his job in the crime gang secure. He could just be saying it to show off. Police knew that they had to get Cowan to lead them to where he had buried Daniel. Arnold says to Cowan, you need to go back to Queensland. I'm going to send you with Fitzy and Ian. You're going to show them where the body is. You're going to show them everything. And then we're going to sort it from there. And so Cowan, possibly naively, flies back to Queensland with Fitzy and Ian and leads them straight to where he has buried the body. Fitzy and Ian are secretly marking the path on the way and when they return to the car, the police are waiting there to arrest Cowan. They arrest him and he smiles. He declines any sort of police interview and he's charged with murder, kidnap, deprivation of liberty, indecent treatment of a child and mistreatment of a corpse. Turns out, Brett Peter Cowan was always the police's prime suspect, but they could never ever do anything to pin it on him, which just sounds very unlucky to be honest, considering how poorly Cowan attempted to disguise the body. Now obviously police searched this secluded woodland a lot and they didn't actually find any evidence of a body, any evidence of Daniel ever being there for four days. It was only on the fourth day that they found one of Daniel's shoes, his left shoe, then later found his right shoe. Over the course of the investigation in this woodland they found 17 small bone fragments that first DNA told them all belonged to the same person and then with more intensive DNA testing they confirmed that without a doubt these were the bones of Daniel Morecambe. In the creek where Cowan had thrown his clothes they found remnants of underwear, belt and shorts. And to top all of this off when Cowan appeared in court he pleaded not guilty. Originally the court were suppressing his name they weren't allowing the media to find out who this man was but Daniel's parents, Denise and Bruce, fought against this and said they needed to have his name in the press, they needed people to know what this man had done, but they also needed any other victims to come forward. And so Brett Peter Cowan was named in the press. His defence argued that Brett Peter Cowan was never the one who hurt Daniel, even though he was the one who'd led them to the body. They said it was Douglas Jackway. The first suspect that I mentioned earlier, they said that the blue sedan and the general appearance were definitely that of Douglas and not of Cowan. They also argued that the confession was inadmissible in court because it had been coerced out of him, it wasn't a natural confession. But of course the police knew this, the police knew that a confession would never be enough, they knew that they had to find Daniel's body off the back of what he said. And that's what they did and so the jury deliberated for eight hours and came back saying that Brett Peter Cowan was guilty of the murder of Daniel Morecambe. This was on the 13th of March 2014, 11 years after his death and he was sentenced to life imprisonment with possibility of parole after 20 years. Personally I hope they lock him away and throw away the key because if I find out in what would it be 17 years now that this man is out of prison I will be disgusted. There is no way that this man wouldn't reoffend if he is out of prison again. He's always been completely devoid of remorse. He smiled when he was arrested. He smiled previous times when he was arrested. In his first court case about child abuse, he smiled the entire way through apparently. Daniel Morecambe was finally laid to rest on December 7th, 2012, nine years after he disappeared. His funeral was held at his old school and everyone turned up to be there for Daniel's parents. And like I mentioned earlier, nothing good will ever come out of a child disappearing but Daniel's parents have done the best that they can. They set up the Daniel Morecambe Foundation which is a huge nationwide charity now in Australia which this day educates children about safety. They go into schools and do seminars and workshops on how to stay safe. I'm sure that Cowan was intent on harming Daniel whether Daniel would come with him voluntarily or if he had to actually physically kidnap him. There's a possibility the outcome may have been the same but Daniel's parents are so intent on educating children so they don't make the same mistake that Daniel did and get into this guy's car. Then of course who's saying that Cowan is even telling the truth there? There is a possibility that Daniel didn't get in voluntarily at all and maybe he did have to be manhandled in. We'll never really know. Daniel's parents also support victims of crime, they give them money, they give them advice, anything they can do to help they do and I think it totally destroyed the family but they're doing the best they can with what they've got. So there you go, that is my first ever solved mystery on this channel. I probably won't make them a regular thing, I do much more enjoy looking into the unsolved mysteries but of course let me know what you think, what you prefer and I will see you in my next video on Friday. Bye guys!